Product not yet rated. Now that the cat's out of the bag and we've announced Evil Genius 2 is landing on consoles soon, we're giving players nine tips to make their first campaign. Are we ready with the voice effect? <clears throat> Unstoppably evil. Oh, hello there. Welcome to our completely above board island lair, where we've got to thinking about how envious we are of the new players who'll soon be taking on their very first Evil Genius 2 campaign when the game arrives on consoles. And then that got us thinking about all the wisdom we've accumulated since the PC release in March. All the big brain thinking, the pro tips, the 4D chess moves we've stored away. So we're going to share those now for anyone yet to take on Evil Genius 2. Hit the subscribe button for more from us and settle down for 9 tips that'll make world domination a hell of a lot easier than those 2-bit clowns in Bond films make it look. Watch and learn, Blofeld. When you move through the tutorial, you're taken along at a pace that makes learning the ropes easy. But when you start a campaign from scratch, it's so tempting to just hit pause, fill all that blank space with every room you'll need all at once, then unpause and watch the wickedness manifest. Doing this, however, is a quick way to empty the coffers. And since you don't have any income from crimes on the world stage yet, those coffers aren't getting replenished anytime soon. Plus, there's this lot's salary to think about. Eco-management's a key part of the Evil Genius 2 experience, so when you're starting out, build only the bare essentials. Barracks, power generators, vault, control room, with plenty of space between rooms for expansion down the line. Once your passive income increases, you can build more in each room, stretch the walls out, and add additional rooms like armories, labs, and archives. Number two from our playbook of ultra-efficient evil is all about layers. No, not layers. Layers. Look, it's the simplest. These kind of layers. And this might be one that trips you up if you've played a lot of the first game, because there was only ever one level to build on in Demis Hassabis and Elixir's 2004 masterpiece. So it's easy to forget that this time you've got loads. But you need stairs to connect them first, so make it a priority for the boys and girls down in the lab. Tick this one off in the lair section and soon you'll have lots of space for expansion. Later on when you need huge floor space for control rooms and farms of power generators, you can devote entire floors to them. The lowest level of certain maps has even got a bit of gold to mine. Mm -hmm. Delicious. On the topic of entire floors humming with the sound of electricity, the screen luminescent with blue from row after row of generators. Suffice to say that these are key to the eco-management we mentioned earlier. Almost everything you place in your lair has a power cost, from doors to sushi servers. Thankfully, cacti require no mains power, which is handy for Gabriel and M because they love filling lairs with them. When your items require more power than you can generate, you'll get a power cut. That means no world stage action, no security, very bad. Anyway, your power requirements always scaling up with the rest of your lair, so eventually you're going to need a veritable warehouse full of heft. You can save a little space by getting the poindexters down the lab to research these nuclear and fusion generators, which output more juice, and while they're not exactly pocket size, they do fit neatly into grids a bit more easily than the long, thin default generators. The trick here is to basically always have one more generator than you need at all times. If you try to go all out at the start, you'll run out of money for no reason. So it's about keeping a constant eye on your layer's power demands. You can see them exactly by hovering on this icon and staying just one generator ahead of them. And now, a little word on heat. When you do bad stuff here on the world stage, the heat level in that region will increase. If it hits max, you'll be frozen out of all activity in that region until the cooldown timer expires, to be avoided then. The route one approach to dealing with heat is to do these purple heat reduction schemes, which decrease the heat value in that region over time. They cost a lot of money though, so a thriftier way to manage heat is to spread your schemes out over as many different regions as you can afford. If you do all your activity in one place, the heat there will skyrocket, but if you're just doing the odd scheme all over the world, the forces of justice will barely notice. Suspicion is the value that governs who turns up at your lair to make trouble, and it's separate from heat. It's always ticking over, so investigators will arrive regularly. Now, if you distract them and they leave with no evidence, or don't leave at all, the suspicion level remains largely unchanged. But if they go off with photos of your wicked deeds, you'll get rogues, saboteurs and soldiers turning up to take you down. You can go about this manually, keeping an eye on the arrival area or casino, tagging each investigator for capture or death, 
or later in the game researching different minion behaviour protocols so you can set all your valets and socialites to distract investigators mode and then set your zones up so that any investigators discovered within your base will automatically be escorted back out to the casino. And it's here you can reduce your investigator's smarts so they won't be able to dig up the dirt on you. Some of you will have been sitting watching this video and going, yeah, 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 get to the bit about traps, mate. What about the traps? Traps, traps, traps! And you're absolutely right to do so, because filling your lair with investigator pulping devices of slapstick mayhem is a fine afternoon. But getting to that stage, and even perfecting it, takes a much bigger space of time. Traps, you see, are a commitment. First, you need to research them in the traps section of your research tree. Then you need to actually pay for them to be built and of course supply the power from your generators. So if you were thinking about popping down a Venus spy trap like a welcome map by the door as soon as you get into the island lair, uh, we've got some news. You can always head over to sandbox mode if you want to get experimenting with deadly corridors right away, but in campaign you want to start small with just an object or two to waylay or rough up investigators so that your guards and mercs can finish the job quickly and easily. And that works out fine because if you're doing everything else right, you shouldn't get too many unwelcome visitors in the island in the first place. There are some video game rules we just roll with. Torches within tombs you discover after thousands of years remain lit. You can take a tank shell and live, but attack dogs can easily one-hit you. And the key to world domination is building loads and loads of lockers. These ostensibly mundane objects determine how many minions your lair can hold, and minions make the evil happen. Ergo, more lockers, better lair. This should be central to your thinking when you're laying out the barracks. Allow plenty of size, not just for the beds, which are frankly optional if you ask me, but for placing rows and rows of these. Later, you can research a more efficient double-sided locker variant to pack even more into your barracks, so make a beeline for this research in the lair research tree to reclaim some tiles back for other things in the late game. Periodically, you'll get opportunities to nick things from the world stage. Big things, like Lady Liberty's torch or the doors off Fort Knox. Things that people will definitely miss, and that your minions will be well impressed to see in your lair. But loot isn't just for show, each item has a unique property that gives you a little perk. Even the flying pig ride, which seems a bit of a bust when you first get it home, actually turns out to be a big hit with the workforce, and raises their morale and vitality when they ride it. The Dodo Educator replenishes smarts and trains scientists, and Pandora's box here well, that drains the smarts of minions who open it. It wasn't going to be good in there, was it? So it's worth doing a bit of reading on loot before you go after it. Check out the channel for other videos on loot, or place loot items in sandbox mode to learn their effects. We're almost home and dry with our tips that'll set you off on a dominant first campaign. But we're not leaving without making it absolutely clear that you need to buy some fire extinguishers. We know it's not very sexy or exciting, but like home insurance or dental checkups, it's one of those things that doesn't seem worth doing at all, until all of a sudden it seems like the most important thing in the universe ever. Fires happen. The investigators break in, sometimes they gather enough intel and raise enough suspicion to warrant visits from saboteurs, and when they hit the scene they start more blazes than Red Ivan's sleepwalking episodes. If you don't have any firefighting equipment, you'll just have to let those fires burn themselves out, taking the objects with them. But when you place extinguishers around, any minion can grab one and save the day. So concludes a round of nine tips to make your first campaign less like a rookie run and more like that of someone who's really, really good at Evil Genius 2. Tips for new players down below, please, experienced genii. Leave us a like if we helped your nefarious cause and subscribe to us for more like this. Catch you next time.